In this video, I want to show you how to replace your head gaskets on this 5.4 liter Triton V8. This is an 03 F-150, so it's a two valve 5.4, not the three valve with the variable valve timing. This is non-variable valve timing. So let's get started. To disconnect the battery, use an eight millimeter wrench and remove the negative terminal. Left some extra pieces here, but I'm gonna fix that in a little bit and as well as the corrosion, but either way, take the terminal off, set it aside to where it can't make connection with the negative battery terminal. Now you don't have to remove the wheel. I did only for camera purposes, but if you come through the passenger side wheel well, you can see the radiator pedcock right here. Take a 19 millimeter socket. I built myself out of some aluminum foil, a little um, shield right here so that the coolant, instead of it shooting straight out on the frame, it can follow down and fall into my collection bucket. Take a 19 millimeter socket, put it on, the um, drain plug and unscrew it. It should not be too tight. If it is, try to work it gently. You don't want it to break and unscrew it until coolant starts coming out. Don't take this out though, because if you do, it'll start shooting backwards. And now we'll just let this drain. In order to speed up the process, let's go remove the radiator cap. There actually is no radiator cap. It's just an overflow cap. This is what holds pressure on the system. So we'll just unthread this. Air will go in as coolant tries to go out. I need to get this cover out of the way, and in order to do that, I have to get the spare tire tool slash jack handle out of the way. So just unclip it from its retainers and set it aside. And now we can just go along and undo all the push clips that hold this down. I don't have any of my original push clips anymore. These are all aftermarket push clips that someone has put in. So whatever yours are, just go ahead and remove them in whatever way they need to be removed. With all the push clips removed, don't forget there are two over here. Lift this up and slide it out of the way. Let's get this air intake out of here. Lift up on this. Underneath, you'll see the wire. Follow it and unplug the mass airflow sensor. There we go. And I'm trying to remove this whole unit, so I'm just gonna unbolt the clamp on the throttle body and take this out as one whole assembly. There is another connector over here. Unplug that. And to actually get to the throttle body, I need to remove this cover, three eight millimeter bolts. Remove these two hoses. And then unscrew this clamp with an eight millimeter socket. Now you can wiggle this whole assembly, pull it right off the throttle body, pick it up and set it aside. With a pair of pliers, remove this upper radiator hose clamp. And then you can break the hose free off the radiator. Sometimes it needs to be persuaded a little bit. So very gently with the um, pliers, break it free. Now you can slide it off. Since the coolant has mostly drained, there shouldn't be any in this hose, which there isn't, that's perfect. On the driver's side, there is the overflow hose. Remove the clamp, break the hose free very gently and remove the hose. Now I will be removing this overflow tank only for visual purposes. You don't have to remove it, but otherwise there's no way I can get the camera in here to show you how to remove these um, lines, the transmission lines. So I like to get a better angle for you. Again, you do not have to remove this. Okay, here we go. Now you can see a lot better. This is what's holding the line on here, this plastic clip. So remove it. Just pry on the two little tabs. At this point, you want to spray some rust penetrant here to lubricate the line, but also clear out any debris. And then you need one of these tools uh, that is specifically made for these lines here. Find the right size, slide it over, and press it in. Make sure you have a collection bucket underneath to catch any fluid that might come out. Okay, yep. Once it goes in all the way and it bottoms out, go ahead and pull on the line. There we go. Take the line out, get your tool off, and then we'll do the same thing to the lower line, which is straight down. And with the line out of the way, you can remove this eight millimeter bolt that holds on the fan shroud. There's one on this side and then one on the other side. So do both. Next, you need a fan clutch removal tool, which looks like this. It's a basically a giant wrench that goes on the end of your air hammer. And you use this to break free the fan clutch from the pulley here. And you wanna do this before the belt is off. That way it can be held in place as much as possible. So situate your tool and you want to spin it counterclockwise. This is a regular thread. It's not reverse thread. 
that's it, it broke free. Sometimes it takes a lot more than this, but at this point, you can spin it and it should come off of the pulley. Make sure you don't drop it though, so be careful as you do this. Okay, there we go. Now you can pull the shroud and the fan up at the same time. There we go. I'm gonna go ahead and close my pet cock so that it can stop dripping. Nice and snug, but not too tight. It's just plastic. Next, I wanna remove the four 10 millimeter bolts that hold on the water pump pulley to the water pump. Do this while the belt is still on. That way it can be held tightly. Um, otherwise, it's just gonna to wanna to spin on you. I am using an air ratchet, which will work to my advantage because although it's not an air impact, it will have some force to break these free. If you don't have one of these and you have to do it by hand, I suggest trying to hold this uh, with your hand or put a little bit of extra tension on the belt tensioner to tighten this up. Whatever works for you, but you have to get these four broken free. Don't remove them all the way because the pulley will just fly off at this point with the tension of the belt, but loosen them up. Okay, that doesn't work. Luckily for me, I have this tool right here, which is a 3 8 impact. Again, if you don't have it, try to do something else, but what you saw is what most likely is gonna happen. These are all broken free. Let's get the belt off. This right here is the tensioner. As you can see, it has a half inch drive in the head of it, right where the pulley sits. So I'm gonna put my half inch ratchet in there with a small extension. I'm using a uh, long breaker bar because this tensioner is pretty stiff. Go ahead and remove the belt off of anything. Whatever you can reach, let go of the tensioner and remove your tool. And now we can remove the belt. Take a note of how it's routed. I'm gonna show you in the video once it's time to reinstall it, but it's always a good idea to take a picture if you don't have the diagram. With a 13 millimeter socket, remove the idler pulley. With a 10 millimeter socket and a small extension, I'm gonna remove the bolts that hold on this tensioner. Remove the tensioner. Finish removing the water pump pulley. Sometimes these are stuck on here, so grab a little rubber mallet and bonk it. That should break it free. There it is. I have a collection bucket underneath and now I'm going to take out all the bolts that hold on the water pump. I'm going to start at the top and end at the bottom. I'm going to leave this one in, just a few threads so it holds the water pump on. Okay, finally, take that last bolt out. And this is why we were fighting it. The uh, water pump was corroded in there. And uh, you know, the surface doesn't look too pretty, but it's not the worst, so we'll clean that up. Now let's get the power steering pump pulley off. I have the special tool that allows me to do this. Slide it on to the uh, power steering pulley here and tighten up the center shaft. And for me, this is a 25 millimeter wrench that fits on the base of the tool here. That's gonna hold it in place. And a 13 millimeter, which will thread this rod in and therefore pull the pulley off. There it is. Now let's just get the tool off and get your pulley. Now it's time to remove the harmonic balancer, 18 millimeter socket, take out the bolt. 
And now we need a harmonic balancer removal tool. It looks like this, it's a puller, and you need three M8 by 125 bolts, which will thread into the harmonic balancer and will, and will pull it out as you thread in this main bolt. So let's thread these in, that'll hold my puller. I'm just gonna get them started for now, but then of course we're gonna make sure that this is all evenly spaced. Okay, I switched to some smaller bolts because I realized the other ones were way too long. And now we have to center up that puller. I'm gonna make sure that all these bolts are equally tight. It's important to center up the puller. Now I'm gonna use my 19 millimeter socket, thread this in, and as I thread this in, the pulley should come right out. There it is. Perfect. Let's get the rest of this hose off of here. Take the clamp off. Break it free. And remove the hose. Next, let's disconnect the cables for the throttle body. Unhook this spring over here. And then this cable, if you slide it forward um, and push the cable back, it should pop out. And this one, open up the throttle body all the way and just unhook the cable by sliding it to the side. Just like this. And now I'm just gonna unbolt this whole bracket off of the intake. Three 10 millimeter bolts. Take this and just set it to the side. There's a hose back here that needs to come off. At the front here, we have a heater core hose. Grab some pliers, take the clamp off break the hose free and let's remove it off of the intake. Coolant's coming out, keep that in mind. Okay, I guess it was just a drip. Set this aside, a little hose over here. I'm gonna use a flathead screwdriver for this one. Loosen up the clamp, break the hose free and remove the hose. Now this one will stay attached. I'm not gonna take it off the other end because it's actually hooked on to the throttle body right there. I like to get some of these wires and vacuum hoses out of the way. So I'm gonna peel this boot back and with the battery disconnected, we can use a 10 millimeter socket, unbolt the main power wire to the starter. Try not to lose this mounting nut. Take that off, I'm gonna put the nut back on so I can save it for later. And now it uh, looks like someone secured this with a giant wire tie, so let's cut this off. Okay, let's get that out of there. That. Held this broken connector in. Need a pocket screwdriver for this one. Pry the locking tab forward towards the front of the alternator and pull up. And now we just have to remove a few 10 millimeter bolts. This one being one of them. And this one right here. This will take this whole bracket out underneath here. And now the alternator is free come right out. Let's remove the power steering bracket off the intake, 10 millimeter socket. Remove these electrical connectors over here. It leads to the back of the intake there. So I'm gonna grab a little screwdriver and very, very gently pry this hose off of here. Okay. Follow this, goes over there, over here, this red one. Okay, now we can very carefully move this out of the way. The wires are very fragile, or the, the hoses, not the wires. We need to disconnect some of these vacuum hoses here. So I'm gonna pull this one off of here, leave the end connected to the throttle body. There's another one that goes back there. Looks like it has a little clamp, so let's grab some needle nose pliers, unhook this clamp, and remove the hose. Whole PCB valve comes out. That's fine, I guess. Okay, finally, this comes off. So now, this can stay right here for now. Throttle body can be removed with all of these hoses still attached to it. I'm gonna use an eight millimeter wrench and remove these bolts that hold the throttle body onto the intake. stay there. On the 
this side, I'm going to have to use a swivel. Okay, here it is. Take that out. Now we have to undo the EGR valve. So it looks like this whole assembly is connected with this bracket, and then this is connected to that, which is also connected to this, and it's like a whole concoction of things that need to come apart. So I'm going to start by unplugging the exhaust pressure sensor or the EGR pressure sensor and it can stay attached to the bracket. But we have to unbolt this bracket from the intake with a 10 millimeter right here. Now this can come off and we can disconnect or unplug the two hoses that go to EGR. And now we can unbolt the EGR from the throttle body. To do that, you can use a deep 10 millimeter socket. This big one can come with the throttle body, but this one back here needs to slide off. There's a connection back there. Let's unhook that. There's your throttle body with all the attachments and hoses and everything. Now I need to unplug and remove all of the ignition coils and then unplug the fuel injectors. So I'm gonna just unplug both at the same time. Just start on one side, work my way to the other. The fuel injectors can stay with the intake, but the ignition coils need to be removed. Use a pocket screwdriver for this connection here. Try to pry up the tab and, discon and disconnect it. I'm gonna leave this over here lift up this harness and just move it out of my way a little bit. Let's get a seven millimeter and unbolt all the ignition coils. Let's do the same to the driver's side. Okay, so now to disconnect these fuel lines, you need these special adapters that you can slide over the line. I'm going to start with this one. Press the adapter in. Okay, pull the line towards the tool. Try to push it back. There we go. I know you couldn't see that, but there it is. All right, let's do the other one. This one is a larger size. Um, do the same thing. Press the tool in. Once the tool bottoms out, press the line or pull the line towards you. Okay. And just like that, you can, oh, yep, there, there we go. There's always fuel in the line, so, you know, watch out for that. And take this out. And now in order to remove this intake manifold, I'm going to take out the nine bolts that hold it on. They're all 10 millimeter in size. So I'm going to start from the outside and work my way in. 
Some of them are different, so remember how they go. This here, for example, holds the thermostat housing in place. line out of here. Let's lift up the intake. See if there's anything else connected to it. Okay, there it is. Set this aside. Remove the old gaskets. Let's get rid of some wiring here. Well, not get rid, but just, you know, go a bit to the side. So unplug this connector and this connector. Use a pocket screwdriver to pry the connector up or the locking tab. That wire over there. Okay, perfect. This harness is free. It can sit right there. Through the passenger side wheel well, I'm taking the passenger side out, but the same applies to the driver's side. I'm gonna disconnect the bolts from the manifold to the rest of the exhaust first. And for me, they are 15 millimeter nuts. Hopefully they come out. If not, I'll have to just cut them. This one came off the nice way. Now you can grab your tool of choice and get this collar off of here. Okay, well, looks like I got this thing stuck on here, but I'll fix it later. Now, to get the actual manifold out, there are four bolts on top and four underneath, so just start from one end and work your way to the other. bound to happen. I guess we'll have some welding to do. All right, those are the four top ones. Let's move to the bottom and do those. You can't really see them very well, but I'll try to get you the best angle. Last one. There we go. Only one broken stud on this side. That's uh, good, I would say. Now we can remove the manifold. There it is. And now with the manifold out on the passenger side, we have to remove this eight millimeter bolt that holds the transmission dipstick tube in. This is free. Just let it hang over here. At this point, I'm going to do the same thing to the driver's side. If you start it over there, then just come to the passenger side, do the same thing. Take the manifold out, unbolt the oil dipstick tube, which is going to be there, as well as the power steering bracket, which I'll show you um, in a little bit from at the top where it actually goes. So this is the power steering reservoir. It has this bracket that goes all the way down. This is what we want to unbolt. And now through the driver's side wheel well, I want to remove these two bolts over here, which I mentioned from above are the ones for the power steering reservoir. They're going to be pretty difficult to get to. And uh, I'm going to start with the one that you see first. Okay, let's give this a shot. 18 millimeter socket. Okay, I guess I'll try to break it free by hand. Okay, broke that one free. There is another one next to it. I'm gonna try and break that one free as well while I'm at it. I know you can't see it, but I'll show you it in a second. Okay. And 
there's the other one right there, right between these brake lines. Also on the driver's side, you have this eight millimeter bolt that holds the oil dipstick tube in. So let's go ahead and remove this. Get this out, oil dipstick tube is free. And with it unbolted, what we can actually do is uh, take out the 10 millimeters that hold the reservoir onto this bracket. So we can just get this bracket right out of our way. This one can actually stay in. Okay. Next, you have to get the valve covers off. I'm gonna start with this driver's side here because you can see it better on camera. I'm still gonna show you the passenger side, but it's gonna be the same thing. And like I just said, you get a better view over here. Okay, eight millimeter bolts all around both of these valve covers. Let's go for it. This valve cover should be free. Yep. Pull it up. Get the gasket up with it. There's one of them. All right, on this side it's gonna get a little more interesting because the wiring harness is a lot stiffer. Uh, I won't move out of the way like this one and we'll have to get the bottom bolts from underneath from the uh, wheel well because all of this is going to be in the way. So let's just do the top first for now. And from the passenger side wheel well, here's what you see. I'm going to start back here because I already have a short socket on my air ratchet. So before I change it out to a deep socket, I'm just gonna work my way from the back to the front because I need the short socket in the back here. Oh, that one's already done. All right, valve cover's free. Oh yeah, let's go up top and take it out. All right, let's get the wire out of the way. The PCB hose is already disconnected. So lift up on the valve cover. Hopefully all the bolts are completely loosened up. Okay. I tried to move the wires around a little bit. Oh, okay, okay. Hey, hey, there we go. And now it's finally time to take the timing cover off. I'm gonna start over here and just work my way around. This is actually just a nut that holds on this wire. And then um, with an 18 millimeter, you can take that off. Okay, this one's actually a 15 millimeter. These ones around the water pump have this shanked uh, part and the thread is actually smaller, so keep that in mind. This one's also an 18. Same with this one over here. More 13s. This one's full of debris, so I'm gonna try and get the junk off of here. This one here is actually a 22 millimeter. At this point underneath there are a couple oil pan bolts. I'm going to get those in a second uh, but I just want to finish everything from up front here. So I'll move on to this one, 15 millimeter. More 
13s. The nut over here, 13 millimeter, which holds the bracket for this AC um, component. And then behind that hides an 18 millimeter stud. So I figured this out. Um, I'm going to pry the bracket for the transmission lines off of the stud. And with it pried off, that'll expose a 22 millimeter stud just like on the other side. Okay. All right. And it looks like the last thing is to get out the oil pan bolts from underneath. So let's do that. Here you go. From underneath, you can see the uh, four 13 millimeter bolts that we have to remove. All right, let's go back up top and take that timing cover off. We have to take out a 10 millimeter bolt here that bolts this timing cover onto the power steering pump. There we go. There it is. Right next to the AC compressor, you have your crank position sensor, and that needs to get unplugged because it's bolted to the timing cover, of course. Hey, I got it. As you can see, timing cover is loose, so we'll just slowly walk it off of here. Be very, very gentle if you're using pry bars. timing cover. Take that off, set it aside. I want to remove the sensor ring for the crankshaft position sensor. Get that out of there so we can have direct access to the chains. And at this point, I will reinstall my crankshaft bolt so that we can actually rotate this engine and uh, time it properly. So I'll put this on. You don't have to tighten it, tighten it. Just run it down all the way. It'll basically tighten itself once we turn the engine over and then uh, You'll need an air gun to remove it. Okay, that's tight. As you can see, it started moving the engine, so I'm gonna stop right there. Let me show you the proper timing marks. Since we're on the crankshaft, I'm gonna show you this. The crankshaft, this keyway here, needs to be at the 12 o'clock position, straight up and down. And then I went ahead and marked the cams for you so that you can see it better. This is just a, a little indent. The sprocket is notched out. I marked it with a yellow crayon so that you can actually see it. So this is one of them right here on the passenger side cam. And this one needs to be positioned at the 11 o'clock position. So right about here, not straight up and down, a little bit to the left, 11 o'clock. And then the driver side one over here has the same mark. I also marked it with a yellow crayon so you can see it better. This one, however, has to be straight up and down at the 12 o'clock position. So let's rotate the crank and line everything up. So what you're looking for here is 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Pretty simple. In order for me to not fight compression, I'm actually gonna remove all eight spark plugs and get them out of the way. Otherwise, I'm gonna be fighting the compression of every single cylinder as I turn this engine over. This also allows me to inspect them. This engine is known for having spark plugs blow out of it, so this is a perfect time to check it. That one was loose. That one was not super tight, but I guess bottomed out. Loose. We're looking build up on this one. Check this out. Look at that build up over there. This one not even, not even gonna try to be tight, or what are we doing here? This one was like, you know, just ready to come right out. Probably hanging on by a couple threads. Yeah. Well, they all looked good except for this one, and I'm gonna say that this is the cylinder with the blown head gasket. All right, now it's time to turn the engine over and uh, 
line up the timing marks. No compression in our way, which is going to be a lot easier. Oh yeah. So I have a broken timing chain guide here, so I'm going to actually hold it down manually. That way the chain can actually sit where it needs to sit. All right, so I'm at 12 o'clock there, 11 right here. Um, the only problem is I'm not at 12 down there, so I'm going to have to go around one more time and uh, line it all up. I got all my marks lined up. Let's take out the passenger side timing chain tensioner, which is this one over here. I'm going to loosen up the two bolts for it. They are 10 millimeter bolts. Use a 3 8 Allen. A 10 millimeter is going to be way too tight to fit. 3 8 will fit perfectly inside of this groove here. Stick it in with a breaker bar. Move the cam around to release the timing chain off of the cam. Let go of it. No damage will occur even if the pistons do contact the valves because there's no, um, it's not going to move up and down. You can just slowly let it go. And because I have my quick release timing chain guide here, I'm joking, you know, it's broken. So typically you'd want to unbolt it. Mine just fell right off. We're going to take these bolts out in a minute, but now you can take the timing chain off. Do not rotate it. Don't rotate the crank at this point. Don't rotate this side. Um, it's not timed anymore and you will cause damage if you start rotating things. Let's do the same thing to the driver's side. I'm actually going to hold the cam with my 3 8 breaker bar here and undo these bolts. Take these out, take out the tensioner. out of here. Slowly let go of this. You can take out this timing chain guide. Since I forgot, might as well do this now. Take off the passenger side timing chain guide. And to finish it off, let's unbolt this timing chain guide over here with an eight millimeter socket. Might as well break these two free. The one from the passenger side with the broken guide. Okay, let's get all these out. So I'm going to show you the removal of both, but I, this is a better angle here. Removal of this cylinder head will be a little bit easier than the passenger side. This is the driver's side. And I'll show you why in a little bit, but uh, for now, I just want to go ahead and remove all these head bolts. There is a sequence to them. It's important that you follow it. Break them free with a breaker bar. Do not use an impact, even though it might be tempting. Break them free first, about half a turn at most then go back around and remove them. Don't just remove one bolt at a time completely. Another thing I want to mention is, like I said, the sequence. I will show you the sequence on the screen here. The removal is just the reverse of the installation. So I'm going to start here. We want to work from the outside in to the middle. I'm going to start with this one, then go over here, and then back there, here, and so on. They are all 13 millimeter headed bolts. So having said that, let's get the breaker bar on here and break them free. I switched to a long ratchet just because of space limitations here. Okay, this is all I'm gonna do on this first pass. Like I said, I don't wanna remove anything. I just wanna break them free. Now I'm gonna switch to my ratchet so I can uh, take these out a little more. All right, let's do the same sequence all over again. This time, breaking them free completely.
Okay, they're all broken free completely. So now I'm gonna get my air ratchet with a 13 millimeter and drive them all out. They're all loose. You can even take them out by hand, but I need something a little faster. All right, I changed my mind. I'm just gonna use my 3 8 impact. They're all loose anyway, so it should be fine. <laughs> All right, let's fish them all out. Uh, they do have washers on them, keep that in mind. So take the washers off as well. And uh, don't save these, don't reuse them. These are torque to yield bolts, so they need to be thrown out. Oh, oh yeah, also, um, we're gonna make a mess now. I'm gonna take out these bottom ones first. All right, this is all of them. The head is now unbolted from the block, so I'm gonna set up a nice surface for it to sit on. I have some, uh, some pads that I can put it on. This being aluminum, I don't wanna just put it on the floor or on a steel bench or anything that might damage the surface. Even though we are getting it machined at the machine shop, you don't wanna just destroy the surface for no reason. So uh, let me prepare that and then we can pull the head off. Take this out of here. Oh yeah, wonderful. Well, here's your head gasket. And uh, you know, sat like that. Got a little bent up, but that's all right. I'd say right here. And now for the passenger side cylinder head, we're gonna start on that bolt, go to this one, that one in the back, this one in the back, basically the same procedure. They're all broken free, and let's loosen them up completely. They're all loose. Let's get them all out of here. Take them all out. Now, the trick on this side is going to be that one of them is not going to come out. And the service manual says remove the engine. Yeah. That's not happening. So let me show you how we're going to get this out. Can you guess which one it is? It's not going to come out. Here's what we're going to do. You can use a piece of hose and once you lift up the bolt, put the hose about this long, cut it in half, 
put it around so the bolt can't drop down or use a wire tie, which is what I'm gonna do. Just wire tie it tight right here and then it can't drop down into the hole. And then it's out of the block, but it's still in the head so we can just pull the head out. All right, so pull this bolt up, tie a wire tie around it. Make sure you put it low enough to where it's gonna actually do what you need it to do, but not low enough to where it's gonna be too high, if you know what I mean. You can always adjust it. Let's try this height right here. Okay, ready? It's gonna make a mess. Mm -hmm. Basically the 10 millimeter nut let go of this ground wire. There's the nut. Now you can remove the ground wire and this allows us access to remove the stud. So we got some more stuff out of the way. Um, disconnected this wiring harness here and then this bracket can pull away and once you pull away this bracket off of the stud that we just took that nut off of that will allow you to get your wrench on there well regardless of that one there's another stud that we have to remove which is right over here if you just follow this bracket here 10 millimeter socket or wrench okay so here's the nut take that nut off that lets go of this bracket completely we can remove it so that it's out of our way. We have two studs to remove so we can disconnect this water pipe off of the head. The first one is this one over here that we already wrenched on earlier. All right, I'm gonna grab my 13 millimeter wrench. There's another one down here. Okay, there we go. Okay, looks like it can come out by hand. At this point, oh, I guess it, it can stay, but I might as well, you know, remove it. All right, now we can pull the head out. Pick it up and remove it from the vehicle, just like this. Our head bolt trick worked. Here we go. Now I have a stud here that snapped off in the head and I need to weld a nut on it so I can extract it. I could drill it out, but I prefer welding a nut to it because the head being aluminum, you can accidentally get the drill bit into the head and then you're looking at much bigger issues. And because this stud is actually recessed into the head by just a few millimeters, it snapped off uh, further down and it's not flush. I'm gonna puddle up a little pool of weld there. I'm gonna build up the material with weld so I can put the nut flush and then weld it flush with the head. And then uh, once the nut is cooked on there very well and it's firmly bonded, go ahead and take your wrench and just slowly work it back and forth, back and forth until it frees up and you can remove it all the way. And once you've managed to free it up, go ahead and take it all the way out and there you have it. So before the heads go to the machine shop, you have to remove everything off of them, not the camshaft, but everything else any exhaust bolts that are left or studs, any sensors, nuts, bolts, attachments, anything. So I'm gonna try the double nut method um, and hopefully it works. It hasn't, I had several uh, studs that were stuck in here and I, one of them was broken, had to weld a nut to that one and uh, get it off like that. And then I had a couple that I used a double nut method on, it didn't work, so I had to weld a nut to it and pull it out. Um, and some of them did, it, uh, the double nut method worked. So tighten these two together. And as you can see, it's not spinning the stud, it's just spinning the nuts. So what I'm gonna do is, I already know this is not gonna work. So I'm going to take a nut, I cleaned it up, and I'm going to put it on the stud, weld it, and pull the stud off that way. I chose a castle nut, it looks like this, because I can weld in between the little, uh, castle things. It doesn't have to be a perfect fit or perfectly centered on there. It just has to fit. Take your appropriate sized tool and remove the uh, stud. And there it goes. There you have it. And now on the driver's side head, we also have to remove this coolant temperature sensor, take a 19 millimeter socket or wrench, break it free. 
and remove it all the way. Set this aside safely because obviously we'll have to reinstall it when the uh, head comes back. I also want to remove the dowel pins that sit in the head. If they got stuck in the head, if they're in the block, then, well, take them out of there when the time comes. But you have to remove these because the machine shop will remove them for you. You just might not get them back. So you need these. Well, you don't need them, but they are very useful when you install the head because this one and one on the opposite end are what situate your head and your head gasket perfectly so that it lines up so you can just drop the bolts in and tighten them up without worrying. So save these. All right, it is time to do some cleaning. I'm gonna show you this side. The same thing applies to the other side. A few things to note. Number one is this is a cast iron block. So scratching up the surface with something like a razor blade is not going to happen. Uh, well, I mean, maybe you could, but you'd have to work pretty hard to do this because the razor blade will be softer than the block. So I recommend a razor blade. This is what I'm gonna use. They do make special scrapers. You can use that. That's fine too, as long as you don't dig into the surface. Another thing I will do, which is optional, um, but I recommend it if you have the opportunity to do this, is to take some emery cloth, super fine sandpaper with a sanding block. Do not do this by hand, freehand. You need a sanding block. You need something flat and even with very fine sandpaper. And you wanna just basically deglaze this surface. Uh, I'm not saying you should rough it up or um, take away material, but if you have the opportunity on top of the razor blade, it's just an extra step in the cleaning process that will definitely ensure a proper seal of the head gasket. Again, if you don't have the opportunity to do this because you don't have a sanding block or you don't have the right sandpaper or whatever, just skip the step. You're better off not doing it and just cleaning with a razor blade or your special scraper than ruining this surface. A couple more things is these right here are holes where the head bolts go. This one has a dowel pin, same with one back there. And these are all coolant ports, as you can see. So the, the triangulated ones are coolant ports. The small round ones are head bolt ports and these three at the bottom are oil drain ports for where the oil drains back down into the oil pan from the head. Um, so don't blow any air in there or oil will shoot out the oil pan from, you know, pressure building up and oil shooting out. Anyway, also try to avoid blowing air into the coolant passages only because it'll shoot out and make a mess everywhere. Not, nothing bad is gonna happen, it's just gonna cover your engine bay in coolant, and that's not ideal. Having said that, let's get a razor blade, start scraping, and don't dig in too much. You're not gonna get it looking new with a razor blade, um, but you wanna get rid of all the raised surfaces. I'm gonna clean it all down with gloves on, but then you'll see me taking my gloves off, and that's because I like to feel the surface with my fingertips so I can feel whether there's a slight bump or more debris that I didn't feel. Sometimes you can't feel it through gloves. So on this type of surface, um, after I clean it up and everything, I like to go over with my bare hands and actually feel for any gasket material or debris that's left. I also recommend having access to some compressed air. I have my blow gun ready to go here. That's what I'm gonna use to blow out not only the pistons or the, the cylinders around the piston, but also the head bolt holes. We're gonna have to clean those out, degrease them, and then blow everything out. You don't want any liquid in there. If there is liquid and you put the head bolt in, the liquid, the liquid will get compressed and it will crack, well, it will most likely crack your block. So you don't want that to happen. The bolt will overpower the force of the liquid being in there. So let's get started. Razor blade job is done. Next, I'm gonna take a rag, degrease this whole surface, and then we will take our sanding block with some sandpaper and sand it down. If you're wondering what kind of sandpaper to use, something really fine. 
uh, maybe like a 1,000 grit, maybe 800, something like that. You don't want anything coarse. But anything too fine won't do anything because this is, you know, cast iron, so. All right, let's uh, degrease it. You can start with some dry sandpaper, um, or you can use some brake parts cleaner as you sand. The way I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna start with a dry, and then use brake parts cleaner. Okay, let's grab a lint-free rag and try to soak up all this brake parts cleaner that I've put all over the surface. And uh, just try to wipe it clean. Then we'll continue with cleaning out the uh, cylinder head bolt holes, as well as the cylinders in here, the face of the pistons and all that. All right, here comes the messy part. The way I like to clean the holes for the head bolts is I fill them up with brake clean, let it sit for a minute, and then just blow it out with the air gun. Before I do that, I will start by blowing it out with the air gun to make sure that there's no debris in there. Uh, otherwise, I'm just mixing it all together. As you can see, there's oil and coolant and debris in there. I'm gonna cover it up with a rag as I blow these out. Now let's fill it up with brake cleaner, let it sit and uh, do its thing. It's time to blow these out. All right, we'll let those dry. Blow out around the pistons. Give it one last wipe down, especially on these ones where the piston's all the way down so that we can lubricate the cylinder walls. And then once you do the same to both sides, we can turn the engine over by hand. I didn't want to turn it over with a bunch of debris in here in order for it not to uh, be scraped up on the uh, cylinder walls. Well, that looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna take my glove off and I wanna feel everything and make sure that it's nice and clean. Let's get this cleaned up. I wanna make sure that it's flat and uh, there's no gasket material left over around these ports, around the cylinders. This all feels perfect. Over here, I don't like how that feels. I'm probably gonna take the razor blade to it and uh, I bet you I'll get some more stuff off of there. Let's do that. Look at that, that was a little bit left. See now, right around the piston rings there, it's important to get it all off because that's where the head gasket will most likely not seal if there is buildup. And then uh, you definitely don't want to have to do this over again. I'm using a, uh, a new razor blade, by the way. I used a new one the first time. I'm using another new one now. I don't want a damaged blade scraping up the surface. Okay, this looks good. What I want to do now is I'm going to put on a new glove. I'm going to blow out these uh, piston areas one more time. Wipe off the cylinder walls with a clean rag. Now I'm gonna take some clean oil with a clean glove and I'm gonna coat the cylinder walls. Don't be afraid to put too much oil, worst case it'll just come out. And once these are all lubricated, we can turn the engine over. In these ones I'm gonna put extra oil. There we go. I'm using just regular engine oil. You can use assembly lube, whatever you want. Anything that's lubricated. Uh, I suggest against penetrant, because sometimes that has other chemicals in it that are not as lubricating as engine oil. And because my heads are at the machine shop and this engine will be sitting open for five, six days, I want to coat 
the surface here with oil so that it does not flash rust. I don't want any rust building up on this, even if it's very light surface rust. I don't want it. So with a very light coating on my glove, just coat this surface and this thin layer of oil will help keep it nice and clean while the heads are being cleaned up at the machine shop. Now that we can turn the engine over, let's bring this cylinder up here. Let's give it a quick cleaning. I sprayed some rust penetrant on here, and the reason I'm using that is because this particular one is pretty good at dissolving this gunk here. You could also use brake parts cleaner, but rust penetrant will keep it lubricated. And then I'm gonna take a razor blade and scrape off all this debris, all this carbon buildup here. You're not gonna hurt the piston doing this. Don't dig into it with a screwdriver or anything, but the razor blade is gonna be fine. And I'm gonna go around the edge and clean this up as well. Rinse it off. And at this point, if you wanted to, you could use a brass brush and finish it off. Rinse it again. Wipe it to get all the excess oil off and blow around the piston. to get all the debris off that could have made its way in there. And then just do the same thing down the line. With the heads back from the machine shop, they've been cleaned, pressure tested, resurfaced. Everything is all set. I even got new valve seals put in. So it's time to put the coolant temperature sensor back into the head so that we can reinstall the heads. Then I'm gonna take my 19 millimeter wrench or you can use a socket, whatever you have, and just bottom it out, make sure it's nice and snug. Go until it stops and then give it a little extra and then stop. I put some Teflon tape on the thread so that I can seal up nicely. Okay, stopped right there. I'm gonna give it a little bit extra, and then it stopped. What I wanna do now is take some brake parts cleaner on a rag, degrease this whole surface just in case it has any contaminants or oils on it, and I'm gonna do the same thing to the block, and obviously the same thing to the other head, then we can put these on. Use a lint-free rag. Um, if you don't have that, maybe you have a microfiber or something that will not leave any lint behind. Try to wipe this off nice and clean, as you can see. Not the, not the cleanest, you want it clean. Now let's do the same thing to the block on both sides, of course. Put brake parts cleaner on a rag and wipe it off to make sure it's nice and clean. If you remember, we did lubricate it with oil, so I wanna take all that oil off now that the heads are back and make sure that it is nice and dry, ready for the head gasket. Let's take the blow gun, get rid of any debris that made its way in there. Now it's time to put the two dowel pins in. One goes over here. I have them in my pliers so I can squeeze them down as I insert them. There we go, all the way down. These are gonna help you situate both the gasket and the head. Same thing with the rear one. That goes all the way back there. Okay. Make sure it's pressed all the way down. And of course, do the same to the other side of the block. To get the head bolts ready, I put a very light coating of oil on all of them. I'm gonna let them sit here so that all the excess oil can drain off. As you can see, some is already dripping off of them. This, if it's dripping like this, it's too much oil. So I'm just gonna let them sit for five, 10 minutes. The service manual suggests that you coat the threads with a rag as well as the head right here where the washer contacts the head so that you can eliminate most of the friction of when you actually thread these on. That's, that's the point of oiling them. You don't want too much because then it, in one, you get an inaccurate torque, it's too lubricated, and two, you can put oil down in the hole where the threads are, and you will basically compress that oil. Obviously, oil doesn't compress, so it'll just crack the block. So you don't want too much oil, but you do want them lightly lubricated. 
So like I said, I sprinkled some oil on them, made sure they're fully coated, and I'm just gonna let them sit here for a little bit. Um, I might've put a little too much on, so I'm going to turn them this way. Maybe put a rag here so it can absorb all the oil. And then in like five or 10 minutes, we will get these into the engine. From the machine shop, these heads will not be timed properly. They will not be ready for installation. As you can see, this is my timing mark here. This needs to be at 12 o'clock for this driver's side head. And then for the other side, the passenger side, this needs to be at 11 o'clock. So obviously we have to time these. Unless you have the proper tool, you can use this 3 8 Allen and um, lift up the head a little bit. If it's sitting on a surface, I have a nice pad here so that the valves don't actually get damaged. Um, or the surface, obviously. So lift it up a little bit, and then you're gonna wanna rotate the cams. It's not gonna be easy. You're gonna wanna spring back because of the tension of the spring. Actually, it might be better if I lay it sideways like this, and then just spin this over until you line up your timing mark. Uh, this one lines up pretty much, so there you go, right there. That's at the uh, 12 o'clock position. Well, once it's in the car, it'll be like, here somewhere, but this is as close as it's gonna get with it out of the car, which is totally fine. Once it's in and we're ready for timing chains, we can just pull this back a little bit and it should be all set. Now you can also look at the valves here and note which ones are sticking out. As you can see, um, this exhaust valve is out. This intake valve is out. This is partially out. These two are in. Um, these two are in, this one's in. The only cylinder on the block that we have raised up all the way, it's at top dead center, is this one over here. And as you can see, this intake valve is open, but it's not open all the way. So if you notice, this is open all the way. At, in this position right here, it will not touch. It will not make contact. And actually to time it right, we actually have to go even further back and suck it back in. So this is not an issue whatsoever. We can put the head on like this. It will not contact the piston. Your next question might be, how do I know which head gasket is which and how do I put them on? Well, you can see it has some raised areas here. This is what contacts the head. The other side is flat and that's what goes onto the block. Also on this particular engine, you'll notice that this one has this long tab that sticks out here. The other one does not. It has two short ones just like here. So there really isn't any way to put them on backwards because you'll see that it just doesn't look right. It doesn't fit right. So in this case, the one with the long tab, is going to go on the driver's side head or on the driver's side of the block like this. I have my dowel pins lined up, everything is clean. Slide this down. Now put the head down, try to not scratch up any surface. Slide it back, line it up with the dowel pins. I have a head bolt ready so that when it does drop in, I can just put that head bolt in. Oop. Lines up on the front, lines up on the back. Perfect, that's in. I'm gonna put in this middle upper one right here and thread it on a few threads so that it can just be held here and it doesn't risk falling. Obviously I'm not tightening this yet, but there we go. Now if it wants to fall off, well, it can't. Let's put in the rest of the bolts in the proper order. Make sure no wires are obviously pinched anywhere. That would be bad. And um, we'll torque it. At this point, the heads are clean, obviously. So make sure you don't put any debris in here. I'm gonna wait to move a lot of these wires until the valve covers are on to protect all the internals. All right, let's put in the rest of the bolts. I'm not worried about the sequence yet. I'm just literally putting in the bolts. I'm gonna start them on by hand because I don't want them to cross thread. That would be a really, really bad thing here. So drop them all in. There should be five at the top, five at the bottom. Now I will run them down by hand until they bottom out in the sequence that I need to torque them in. It doesn't really matter for this particular step, but I still want to do it in that particular sequence. So you start from the middle and work your way out. At the bottom on that one is where you start, and then you go to this one, then you go over to that one, then here, then there, then here, and so on. I'll show you the uh, sequence on the screen. Now that they're all bottomed out, let's do the same sequence, torque them to 30 foot-pounds, which is gonna be your first pass. Your second pass is gonna be same sequence, but 90 degrees, and then a third pass, again with 90 degrees in the same sequence. So in the end, these are gonna be pretty tight. Okay, 30 foot-pounds, here we go.
That was the last one on the first pass. I'm just gonna double check them again before I move on to the second pass because this is basically the baseline torque that the degrees are based off of. So if this is wrong, your final torque is gonna be wrong because from now on, we're not talking foot pounds anymore, we're talking degrees. So basically this is the only time for you to get the baseline right. From here, it's just gonna get skewed more and more if it's wrong. So I'm just gonna double check them. As you can see, that one was very loose. Same with that one, because as I tighten the last few, the first few will loosen up. All right, so if those first ones are good, the rest are good, so let's do 90 degrees. My torque wrench can read degrees, so I'm gonna calibrate it. If not, 90 degrees is a quarter of a turn, so just mark your, mark your turns. From this point on, if you're a couple degrees off, it's, it's fine. Um, so just do your best. Here we go. So oh, that was the second pass, that being the first one at 90 degrees. And now let's do a second pass at 90 degrees. And this is where it gets tough, because it, one, it's not gonna be easy, and two, uh, it's gonna be a little uh, nerve wracking hearing those bolts creaking. Um, that's why it's important to lubricate them. You wanna overcome that friction. You don't want any broken bolts here. And obviously, same sequence. Here we go, second pass at 90 degrees. Okay. 
Second pass complete. The head is torqued. At this point, you don't want to touch the head bolts anymore. Leave them as is. They should all be perfectly tight. At this point, let's do the same thing to the passenger side head, and let me show you that trick with the head bolt that I was mentioning. It's kind of the same as taking it out, just in reverse. Now it's time for the passenger side. Let's lay the head gasket down here on the dowel pins. Make sure it's properly seated. Everything is nice and clean still, so that's perfect. I know this wiring harness is kind of in the way here, but there is no way to actually push it out of my way, so when I come in with the head, I'm just gonna you know, have to push it out with the head. It's my only option. Oh, and on the head bolt, I put this wire tie here so that it doesn't drop down into the head past this, and it won't hit the accumulator, but it also won't make contact with the block so that the head can actually slide on there. You'll see what I mean. Well, I mean, you did the job, so, you know, you already know. Just as a reminder, that head bolt goes in the second to last bottom hole there. Put in some of these head bolts here. I'm gonna pull this wiring harness over this way. This should give me a little bit more space here. I'm gonna put in the rest of these head bolts. And obviously, just like on the other side, thread them on by hand so that they start in properly. Cut that wire tie off of this tricky head bolt. Start that one in. 30 foot pounds, here we go. Do one more pass at 30. Now, let's go for 90 degrees. And second pass at 90 now. That's all of them. They're torqued and they are all set. So it's time to put the timing chain on. So when you get your new timing chain, you'll notice that it has two links at the top that are colored. These are gold, I've seen them blue. They can be any other color, but they are a different color than the regular chain. And then there's one on the other end that is also colored. So two at the top, one at the bottom. If you stretch it out and hold it flat, this bottom one should sit perpendicular to the other ones. And then these top ones sit parallel to each other, just like this. And these two have to line up with the mark on the camshaft. And then the bottom one needs to line up with a dot on the crank sprocket. I have another sprocket here. It's, I'm not installing it. This is from another timing chain kit. But the sprocket has this dot here and that is what the chain needs to line up with. And the reason I'm showing you now is because the dot is underneath 
you can't see it from up top, you'll need a mirror. So this is what it needs to look like. You have this dot lining up with this one colored link here, and that's how you know you install the chain properly on the crank. This applies to both the inner and the outer chain. So this is what you're looking for on the bottom, and on the top, the chain needs to line up just like, like that. You have this line lining up in the middle of these two colored links. So that's all you need to know to properly time this engine. If you line up these two marks on one chain and then these two marks on the other chain, it is timed. That's it. That's all you need to know. So let's put this on. Obviously, I have to start with the driver's side head because this one sits further in and then on top of that goes the passenger side. So let's start here. I'm gonna put on the guides. I cleaned up all my hardware. On the driver's side chain, you have two different bolts for this lower guide. The long one goes into this hole that doesn't have the flat ear coming out like this one. This one takes the smaller bolt and that is because this longer one here actually goes through your oil pump and then bolts on. So it goes down just like this top mounting bolt, the shim for it has a little bit of play to it so you can adjust it up and down depending on how you need it to line up. Now I'm going to take my ratchet and snug these up by hand and then we'll go ahead and torque them. These bolts get torqued to 89 inch pounds which converts to about seven and a half foot pounds. If you don't have a torque wrench that goes that low, just make them nice and snug with a small ratchet. Perfect. I coated this guide in a slight coating of oil, very thin layer, so that it doesn't run dry for the first five, 10 seconds, however long it takes for the chain to get fully lubricated since we have a brand new chain. I did the same thing to this tensioner guide. So now to install this one, you'll notice that one has a little hump here. The other one does not. The one with the hump is for the driver's side chain. So slide this on here just like so. And uh, we can just let it float for now. Now I want to put in my tensioner, and because I have a new tensioner, it has this little locking tab on it, which will make it stay compressed until I'm ready to apply tension and pull the tab. So we can actually install it now without worrying that it's going to mess up the timing or make it difficult to install the chain or anything like that because it's completely compressed. So it has a new gasket on here, of course. That's going to seal up nice. The surface is nice and clean. Take your bolts out of the old tensioner, slide them in here, I'll go ahead and start them in. And um, you'll see, actually I should mention this, you'll see that they're marked. It's kind of hard to see on this one because the tab is in the way, but this one says L for left. All right, so let's run these down, and then torque them. These two bolts get tightened down to 18 foot-pounds. Now take one of your chains, does not matter which one. I'm going to position it on the sprocket down here on the inner um, part of the sprocket. And now, before I go further, I'm gonna go grab a mirror and make sure that it's properly positioned. I want it lined up with that dot that I showed you. Oh, one tooth off. Okay, there we go. I am perfectly lined up with it now. You can see there's the dot and there is the um, chain. Kind of hard to see on camera, but you know, it's lined up. So now, don't let go of it, because it's going to uh, skip. And because this side is the tensioner side, it's gonna have to have slack on it, and on the bottom, we'll have to put tension on it. And at the top here, like I said, make sure you line up the, uh, the sprocket with the proper links, just like this. And let's see, we're probably gonna be a couple teeth off. Yep, that's fine. Uh, we're actually not too far off. I'm gonna stick my 3 8 drive extension in there so I can turn the cam. Oh, one more, one more tooth. Okay, right there, put the chain on. There it is. I'm gonna take this guide back off, slide it on the chain, make sure it's positioned properly, and then just go ahead and push everything back into place. 
Make sure this sprocket is in all the way. The guide is sitting where it needs to be. Give this a couple back and forth movements to make sure the chain is fully seated. Oh, see, there we go. It's important to check it. Um, looks like we have some slack here, so I want to check the tooth on the bottom because there's too much tension here, too much slack here. I don't like it, and I think it jumped a tooth. Okay, well, it didn't, so what that means is once tension is being applied here, it's going to turn this cam counterclockwise, which looking at it right now, it's supposed to be at the 12 o'clock position. It's kind of like towards the uh, 1230, closer to the one o'clock position. So that makes sense as to why it has slack on the bottom because naturally the springs want to push it that way, but it needs to come back like this. And then you can see we have tension here and slack here. So that's actually perfect. I'm not going to touch this anymore. Take your three extension out of there. And this chain is on. The tensioner is ready to be engaged, but we're first gonna put the other side on before we pull this. Now let's install this upper guide. Uh, this is the one that was broken for us. Run it down and then torque the bolts to 89 inch pounds. Now I'm gonna put the guide that goes on the tensioner, but I won't put this tensioner in yet. I think on the other side, I should have waited to put the tensioner in. I had a harder time putting the chain on than I would have if I didn't have the tensioner. So I'm gonna leave it like this, uh, put the chain on and then put the tensioner in. Hopefully that makes a difference. And now let's get the chain on. I'm gonna start by guessing the position and then I'll take my mirror and double check it. Okay, so it's one tooth off. It needs to go counterclockwise. Nope, clockwise. There it is, perfect. Lines up exactly on the dot. Um, I'm not gonna show you, you already saw the other side. Okay, so now on this one, the top needs to have tension on it. The bottom is the slack side because that's where the tensioner goes. So this has tension. Obviously we're very far off here. You can see several chain links. Stick your 3 8 ratchet in there. Hold the chain. Spin this and Okay, I gotta go one more tooth. That is it right there. Okay, perfect. We're on. I'm gonna let go, but uh, be very careful when you do this because you don't want it to jump timing. So hold it like this. Don't push the chain down because it'll slack off. This will fly jump timing and fly backwards. So now last thing to do is to put on the tensioner over here. I have it ready with bolts. Pull the chain up, pull the guide up. Everything is lubricated with oil. Make sure the tensioner slides underneath this guide here. Just like that, perfect. This bolt started in. This one just started in as well. We'll bottom these out, torque them to 18 foot-pounds. And the chain is on, the engine is timed. So then we can pull the pin, rotate it several turns to make sure all is well. I'm gonna use my air ratchet to drive it in just so it can go a little faster. I'm not tightening them with this. Now with the chains on, everything is lined up. I double checked all of my marks. This is lined up, this is lined up. Crank is lined up on both chains. It's time to pull the tabs on the tensioners. I'm gonna start with this one. Doesn't matter which one you start with. They should come right out. And now tension is applied to the chain. Now at this point, optional, but highly recommended. Let's spin the engine over by hand and make sure that timing marks still line up after several rotations. As you remember, I have my spark plugs out, so it'll be a lot easier to spin. Oh. No. Okay. Oh, it's 
It's going to take a while for the timing marks to actually fully line up again. But if we just time it back to top dead center, we should know whether we have it properly timed or not. So bring that cam at 11 o'clock. This one's pretty much at 12. And the crank, this pin here, um, it's not going to be at 12 o'clock, but the divot on the bottom, which I can feel right here, is, should be at 6 o'clock facing straight down, which it is. So you can spin it as many times as you want at this point. It should be all set. Here's our timing cover. It's nice and clean. Well, as clean as it's going to get. This is stained. You're never going to get it looking brand new. These gaskets along the side have already come off for me. Uh, they peeled off when I took the timing cover off. This one is stuck and I have a new one. You don't want to reuse this one. I strongly suggest putting on a new one. So what I'm going to do to get this thing off is take a pick where you can take a screwdriver, whatever you have to get this thing started. And once you get it started coming off of here, just peel it off the rest of the way. Make sure the surface is clean, which it is. There's no debris in here, actually, so there's nothing for me to clean. If there is, just take a screwdriver or a pick, again, and just scrape it all off. As you can see, there's some gasket maker left over here. That's because this is where the block and the head meet. We'll have to reapply some when the time comes to reinstall this cover, but for now, I just want to get this off of here so that the new gasket maker can have a clean surface to seal up against. And of course, you want to do the same everywhere where there is gasket maker which leads me into this surface here. You can see there's more gasket maker here, and this is for where the valve cover bolts on. So take whatever you have and clean this off. And I'm just gonna go around and clean off the whole rest of this surface. The reason I'm doing this now, not before I ran this through the parts washer, is because this was so full of gunk and debris, um, I needed it to be clean so I could see what I'm cleaning, if that makes any sense. Do the same thing on the bottom where this bolts up to the oil pan. You want this surface nice and clean because we'll have to put some gasket maker on the corners of this too. I strongly recommend a new front main seal or crank seal whatever you want to call it. You're here, you might as well. So to remove this one, I'm using a seal puller, but you can use a screwdriver, a pry bar. Basically, you just have to pop it out. You can even punch it down and through. Whatever you have to do to get it out of here. As long as you don't damage the surface where it mounts, it doesn't really matter how you remove it. Well, obviously for me, that's not working. It's not even moving. So I'm going to take a punch and just punch it through downward, and then we'll figure out the installation once this is out. go. Make sure you don't damage the surface while you're doing this. There it is. It's nice and uh, clean here, except for at the top it has a lip of debris and buildup. So I'm going to take a piece of very fine sandpaper or emery, emery cloth and just clean the ridge up so that when I install the seal, it doesn't cause any damage. Of course, I will use a uh, clean rag with some brake parts cleaner on it and degrease the surface. A little bit of brake parts cleaner and a clean rag. And look at all the junk we got off of there. Definitely make sure that the surface is nice and clean. Go underneath as well. I think we're ready to install the new crank seal. Now, when you install this seal, you want to press on the outer lip here where it has a metal sleeve going around. You don't want to press on the inside or on this lip here or even in here because it will damage the seal. And even when you do press on the outer lip, you don't just press on one side because you'll end up with something like this where it's all deformed and damaged. You need a cup, preferably. I have this out of my ball joint press and I cleaned it all up and it actually fits perfectly around this seal. It is the exact same diameter as the seal, which is what I'm looking for. And with this, I'm able to press this down and in perfectly flat and evenly around and it will get a nice tight seal in there. With your seal nice and flat, go ahead and tap it in. Perfect. At this point, you want to feel around, make sure that it's perfectly even everywhere, which it is for me. It has seated perfectly. Now, at this point, you want to be careful not to hit the seal or damage it in any way because it's new and it's ready to be installed and you don't want to have to buy another one and do the job all over again. So at this point, let's put the gaskets on. This is not the right one. 
you'll know if you have the wrong one because it, well, it only fits one way. That must be the other side. Oh, there we go. I just found the right side. So it might take a couple tries to actually find the correct side, but once you do, it will literally fall into place. All you have to do is press it down to secure it and just do this for all the other ones. I'll put on this one next. No sealant is required on this gasket here. Don't worry about putting anything on it. This gets installed dry and put this one on. So at this point, the timing cover is ready to be installed. So let's do that. Now we have to put some gasket maker on a few different areas, six areas in total to be precise. Two areas on each head. So right here where the head meets the block, you just put a little dab of gasket maker on here so that the timing cover can seal up properly. You don't need a lot. This is plenty like this. Do the same to the other side, of course, and then do the same underneath where the head meets the block right over here. This one's a little harder to see. Try not to put too much on, just a little bit. And of course, do the same to the other side. Then we need to do something similar in the corner of the oil pan where it meets the block. You can see there's already some. Um, I'm just gonna add a little more. Not the best way to do it. Ideally, you'd wanna replace that gasket, but this should hold up for us. That's about all you need. Don't go overboard because, well, there's no need to. It's just gonna spill into the timing area. So that's not great. It's not what you want. Make sure I level it out with my finger. One last thing before the cover goes on is this toner ring for the crank sensor. Go ahead and put this on. Obviously, we have to take the bolt out first. The little teeth should be facing you. You can see they have a direction, but if you're not sure, it says front on it, and that is the front of the engine. That's what that means. And it can only go on one way because it has this slot for the little key in there. And there you have it. That's all you need. Let's put the timing cover on, bring it down. Make sure no wires are getting pinched. Slide it over. It has two dowel pins that it'll line up with. Just go ahead and press it on. Let's put some bolts in. I'm gonna start down here. Thread them all on by hand to make sure it lines up. I wanna push the cover on with those center bolts. That's why I'm also starting these that go around the water pump. Also, I should have mentioned, but before you put this on, obviously, when you clean and change the gasket on the cover, also clean the surface on the engine so that everything can be nice and clean and seals up properly. So let's run these down and press the cover up against the engine block. Actually, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start a few more bolts because might as well. I'm gonna start all of these studs as well. Remember these all the way at the top had this ground connector on them. Obviously I'm gonna have to take this off, so I'll just do it now. That way we can access the head of the stud. This one also had it, I just took it off. And this one also had this extra nut. That was for this AC line here. So the only bolts that we're missing right now are the one that goes through the power steering pump and then the four oil pan bolts that go up into the timing cover. So let's snug these up and then we'll move to, to those. I'm going very slow with my air gun. Okay, let's get those two large ones on the bottom. I just wanna snug them for now. I will torque them after they're all snugged up. But this is going to pull the timing chain cover evenly onto the block. That's exactly what I want. That's snug. That's snug. Let me re-snug these. And then I actually wanna put the oil pan bolts in so that those holes are all lined up. Run these in as well. And these. Ah! 
So there is a sequence for torquing the timing cover here. You start on this bolt, then you go to this one over here, then this one, then this one, then this one. And these are the 13 millimeter headed narrower thread bolts. So you start with the smallest one, torque those to 18 foot pounds. Then you're supposed to torque those two 22 millimeter studs on the bottom to 35 foot pounds. And then you go to 35 foot pounds in this particular sequence. You go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now we'll switch to an 18 millimeter socket. And now if you wanted to double check them, go ahead, but they're most likely gonna all be perfectly fine. So now let's put this bolt in and then the four on the bottom through the oil pan. That goes in from the side here through the power steering pump. All right, it's getting close here. It's bottomed out and <clears throat> nice and snug. All right, let's put the lower oil pan bolts in. There are four of them, 13 millimeter headed bolts. Slide them in, thread them on by hand. You don't want these cross threading, of course. And the torque for these is in a specific sequence also. One, two, so the furthest ones first, and then three and four, which are the middle ones. And those you torque to 15 foot pounds at first, and then an additional 60 degrees. Fifteen foot pounds. And now sixty degrees. On this lower stud here on the timing cover, let's put on a bracket for this line. This is the uh, transmission line. Slide that on all the way, and uh, we'll have to obviously connect the crank sensor after that. Don't forget about it. Let's put this nut on. This was a 15 millimeter nut. Go ahead and snug it up. Plug in the crank position sensor. You have to push it up hard so it clicks, just like that. Give it a quick tug to ensure, because if this is not plugged in, or it's not making a good connection, your truck won't start. I have cleaned and lubricated the backside of the harmonic balancer where it bolts on to the crankshaft, or not bolts on, but slides on. As you can see, I cleaned this area here. I lubricated it with a thin coat of engine oil so that the seal can slide easily over it as I press it on. I also did that on the inside here so it doesn't get hung up on um, the crank. It goes on nice and smoothly. Use engine oil, not anything else. Now take it, line it up with the keyway on the crank. If you don't line it up, it's not going to slide on. So give it a couple twists until you know that it's lined up. And there we go. At this point, it should slide on. Now you want to put your installer tool on here, tighten it up, and we're going to go ahead and drive this harmonic balancer all the way in. That's bottomed out. Let's release pressure from here. Remove the tool. Remove the rest of the tool. Go ahead and put a little bit of gasket maker on the washer of the bolt, of the crank bolt and then a little bit in between the washer and the head of the bolt, just enough to create a nice tight seal. Stick the bolt in, and then there is a torque spec, but that torque spec is meant for a brand new bolt. I'm gonna give you that, but if you're reusing your original bolt, uh, just do your best and make it nice and tight. Kind of like that. So the full torque spec for a brand new bolt is to tighten it to 66 foot-pounds, Loosen the bolt completely, don't take it out, just loosen it, 
then tighten it to 37 foot-pounds, then an additional 90 degrees. Again, this is if you're using a brand new bolt. Now to install the power steering pump pulley, you'll need a power steering pump pulley installer. Looks like this, it's got one of these threaded rods to thread it in a little bit more. I'm just gonna use the help of my air ratchet. Hold the shaft over here. And just make sure it's bottomed out all the way. Don't have to go crazy tight on it. Slide the pulley over, put the tool back together, and I'm gonna hold the stud and tighten up this nut, which has a bearing in it, and it'll help rotate. And this, as you tighten it, will push the pulley back onto the pump. Be careful how far you push it, though, because if you push it too far, you're gonna have to pull it back out with the removal tool. We'll just take it slow and check every once in a while. So once you get it close, let's remove the tool and then we'll see how far this actually has gone in, if it needs to go more or if it's too far. And there you have it, the pulley is flush with the end of the shaft that's coming out of the pump, that's perfect. If when you put your belt on, you notice that it's squealing and it wasn't before, it's probably because this pulley isn't lined up perfectly. So just try to figure out if it's too far out or too far in and just adjust accordingly. The pump does have a little bit of play in the shaft here and that usually helps with lining itself up. But for some reason, if you put it on too far or not enough, well, like I said, it'll squeal and then you'll have to adjust it. Now with the valve covers cleaned up, let's install some new gaskets so we can put the valve covers on. I'm only gonna show you one side. I actually already did the other side and the gaskets, which I recommend. You'll see that on one side, the groove has a kind of like a split down the middle. That is the side that faces the head. The side that does not have a groove, it just has one pointy area. It goes on the valve cover. And they can only go on one way, as in you can only put the left gasket on the left valve cover and the right one on the right one. And the other sign to look for when you install them to line them up properly is these two areas. These are to be lined up with the head and the timing cover. So basically here and here. Once you have all those reference points, it's easy for it to fall right into place. And then I'll show you how to put the bolts in because if yours have fallen out, which most likely they will, if you take the gasket off, it's not difficult, but it is an annoying process to put the bolts back in. And before we proceed, I have this very poorly drawn diagram that shows where the studded bolts go and where the non-studded bolts go. So this is gonna be the passenger side, which is this one here that I've already uh, assembled. You can see it has a studded bolt here, here, so on the front side of the engine, then one right next to the oil filler neck, and then it skips one, and then it goes to two more studded bolts. Basically, we're gonna replicate the same exact thing on the driver side. It's a mirror image of each other. So stud, 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 skip, stud, stud. So all the bolts are gonna be the same. I'm only gonna show you how to put in one. Once you put this one in, this is gonna be the front corner, so it's gonna be a studded bolt. I'm gonna grab a pick, keep applying pressure on the bolt upwards so it wants to go through the mounting hole and then take the pick and kind of put the gasket underneath the bolt. It has a lip here. It has a lip right here that the gasket has to slide under and only then will it be fully installed. There we go. Twist it around and now your bolt will stay in place. Just go around and do the same to all the other ones. Now to install the valve covers, let's put a little bit of gasket maker right here where the timing cover meets the head on both ends, of course. Not a lot, just a dab. And with the surface still clean, take the valve cover and slide it right over. I'm gonna try and start in a couple of these bolts so that it stays in place stay secure and then we'll thread them on and actually run them down.
I'm gonna come back and torque them, but for now, I'm just gonna snug them up, starting from the center, working my way out. Torque for these is 89 inch pounds in the same sequence, starting from the center, working your way out. Now it's time to put the passenger side valve cover on and I'm going to do the same thing, put gasket maker on those areas where the timing cover meets the head. Here, that's probably a little too much, I'll wipe some off. And down here, you can't see it, but trust me, I'm putting it on. Now the trick to this one is to come in at an angle and then bring it up and over this rear cam lobe over there, obviously underneath all this wiring. At the same time, make sure that the gasket doesn't pop off. just like this, and then twist it, and it should fall right into place. Of course, I'm gonna double check before I bolt it down tight to make sure that that gasket behind, at the or in the back there, is still properly secured. I don't want it pinching and leaking later down the line. Okay, I'm looking at it from underneath, inside the wheel well. It looks great, everything lines up as it should. So I'm gonna start all these bolts down here. That way they're threaded on properly, and I'll just grab my air ratchet, run them down, and of course we will torque them. Okay, I'm gonna start in the center and work my way out. Okay, now let's torque them to 89 inch-pounds. I'm going to start in the center, work my way towards the outside. All right, valve cover's tight. At this point, it would be easiest to install the spark plugs now because the intake is still out of the way. I strongly suggest new spark plugs, but if yours are still good, I guess go ahead and reuse them. The torque for these is 13 foot-pounds. Do not lubricate the threads with anything. They go in dry. Perfect. It's time to reinstall the intake. When you do this, make sure you put new gaskets on. I did. So this is ready to go, the surface is clean. Let's bring the intake in and slide it down onto the head here. Make sure you don't pinch any wires. I'm gonna go back there and double check. Make sure your fuel lines are accessible and not jammed between the firewall and the intake. All right, let's make sure everything's lined up. It is, let's put the bolts in. Don't forget to put this on and then drop the bolts through. Make sure that these line up. I'm gonna start all of them by hand before I go any further. That way I make sure that the threads are good. So now let's put the rest of them back. Now I'm gonna bottom out all the bolts starting from the center, working my way out. And the torque spec for this has two passes in that sequence, one at 18 inch pounds and the other one at 18 foot pounds. 18 inch pounds is basically just bottomed out. So if I just bottom it out, there's the first pass.
Okay, now let's torque them all. 18 foot-pounds. Take his torque down. Let's get the throttle body on. Bring in the throttle body and we'll install this. Okay, make sure the gasket's still seated in place there. And then try to line up the, uh, the bolts. I think this one, yep, that one lines up. I'm gonna start this one in and finally one at the back. Pretty difficult to see all these, but just feel for them. I'm gonna go ahead and bottom these out and then we'll snug them up. All right, so with the throttle body on, I have a slight situation here with the vacuum hoses because I actually bought a new PCV hose system assembly here. So it also came with this hose, which is the coolant hose that leads to this valve on the throttle body. And then from there, it leads through this to the intake. Well, this is staying, but this rear hose has to go as well as I think this one over here, which is to be replaced with this, which is on the new assembly. So basically, you may not have to do this step, but I do. So I'm just going to quickly swap over some hoses. And once it's rerouted, because you probably don't have to do this, I'm not going to show you in detail, uh, but I will show you exactly how it needs to be routed once it's all done. So here's what it's supposed to look like once it's done. Right out of the PCV from the valve cover. Make sure that's pressed in all the way. So from down here, this main long tube, plastic tube, goes all the way to the back of the intake. It's got a large rubber 90 degree fitting on there. Make sure that's plugged in. It tees off of this into a smaller little tube, plastic tube, that feeds the throttle body. This is your PCV. This assembly is a, a heated PCV with coolant, so it has two coolant hoses that go into here. You can see one comes off of the water pump tube off the back, comes into the PCV on the valve cover, goes back out into the throttle body over here, right where the vacuum hose goes in. Then it comes out through this hose, which will plug into the intake. And one of the only other hoses here is a coolant hose, this main heater core hose that also plugs into the intake. So let's get those in. But this is kind of what this is all supposed to look like. It's a mess, not easy to figure out, especially if you were in my situation where someone kind of rigged everything and hacked it together and I had to figure out what piece goes where, but uh, this is what it's supposed to look like. So let's get this main heater core hose plugged in, get the clamp back on, and then get the smaller hose from the throttle body back on as well. This one just had a hose clamp. Go ahead and tighten that back up. Make sure it's pressed down all the way. Nice and snug. Now it's time to reconnect the fuel lines. And to do that, it's much easier than removing them. All you have to do is line them up and press them on until they click and snap into place. It's kind of hard to show you when I'm actually doing it because there's very limited space, but this is what it should look like when you're done. You're supposed to see the spring around it seat right into place. And if you don't see it, that means it has not snapped around the retaining ring on the fuel rail and it will pop off eventually. So make sure that you can see that spring looking retainer around it, double check it, even triple check it if you have to. And obviously we'll check for fuel leaks when we're done. But for now, just make sure that the feed and the return lines are pressed onto the fuel rail tightly. Let's reconnect all of our fuel injectors and then we'll drop the ignition coils in, bolt those up and plug those in as well. When you plug in the uh, fuel injectors, make sure it has a good connection. I'm gonna blow out the holes that the spark plugs sit in. That way when I drop the ignition coils in, there's no debris that gets stuck in there. Just in case any fell. I prefer to put all my ignition coils back in the same order that they came out in. It's not necessary, it's just what I prefer to do. And another tip is to put some silicone paste or dielectric grease on the end of the ignition coils. This will just help them 
to not only seal up better uh, moisture-wise, but also to prevent them from getting stuck on the spark plugs when the next time comes that you have to pull them out. I'm just going to drop all of them in and then I'll bolt them up. While I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and plug them all in. These just have some screws that hold them on, so start them into the intake and just go ahead and snug them up. That's snug, just do the same thing down the line. And of course, we'll do the same thing to the other side once this side's done. So I did the same on this side. I plugged in all of the injectors, ignition coils, bolted them on, everything is all set. Let's situate all these vacuum hoses wherever they have to go. So this hose goes onto the intake tube. We'll leave this aside for now. Same with this one over here. These two connectors will go on a little valve that goes here in a minute. We're gonna ignore that. This goes on the top of the uh, throttle body over there. There are two hoses at the back of the throttle body. One goes to this evap solenoid here, which connects onto the top of the two rear fittings. And then your brake booster line will connect onto the bottom of the two rear fittings. Press that on all the way, make sure that it's secure, otherwise you lose power brakes if that pops off. Then you have this line right over here, which is supposed to connect to your, it's a red vacuum hose, it connects to your uh, fuel pressure regulator down here. And you also have this tan off-white vacuum hose which connects to this EVAP control unit here, uh, which is also where this line comes from, the vacuum hose that connects to the top of the rear of the throttle body. And while we're here, let's plug in the throttle body, or the throttle position sensor that is. That goes over here just like that. On these studs here, I had these ground connectors which plug into this harness over here. Plug that in, secure it, finish bolting up that nut. So I'm just make sure this is all clean, put it on, and tighten up this nut. And of course, we'll do the same to the other side. Now, because I have my driver's side manifold out, I'm gonna put back the two bolts that hold that big bracket, which happens to hold the power steering pump reservoir. The bracket is slotted, so if I start the bolts in, I can slide the bracket over them. Make sure this is nice and snug. And since we're here, let's put the oil dipstick tube back, bolt it up. Perfect. All right, let's get these manifolds on. What I'm gonna do is, um, well, first of all, I cleaned up the surface a little bit. If yours is corroded and everything, you can just use some sandpaper on a sanding block or uh, whatever you have to do to get this cleaned up. I'm gonna put in a couple studs just so I can have this guide to uh, putting the manifold on. I'm gonna put on this one and that one. Next, I'm gonna put on the gasket. And now, the manifold comes with new hardware here at the bottom. Obviously, this is loose, so we're gonna have to tighten it once it's all installed. There's no gasket necessary for this. This is basically a built-in gasket and the rest of the pipe squishes on here, tightens up nice and tight and seals up. You can always use some exhaust gasket maker and seal it up if for some reason your pipe does not seal up, but I'm just going to put it in like this. This is how it was designed. So slide this down. I'm actually gonna take these bolts out because it'll be easier to put this on without them. Okay, we got this to line up. I'm gonna put in more of these studs. Well, all of them, really. They all have to go in, and we'll snug them up, and then put the nuts on. I always recommend new hardware when you're dealing with exhaust, just because from all the heat cycles, it gets brittle, and it's more likely to break in the future if it hasn't already. Now with all of these studs in, let's bottom all of them out. I put two nuts here so they can hold the manifold in place while I bottom out the rest of them. These two studs are already bottomed out, and you don't have to make these tight. Literally just go until it stops turning and 
than to stop there. That means it's, uh, it has bottomed out and we'll do the same top and bottom and then I'll run you through the torque sequence and torque spec. Put on the rest of the mounting nuts. The torque for this is 18 foot-pounds for all these nuts here and you start from this one over here. So you start at the back, move down and then go to this one, move down, this one down and so on on both sides. So regardless of which manifold you're doing, it's the same torque spec and uh, sequence. And then afterwards is when we're going to bolt it onto the pipe. But you want to make sure, uh, since this pipe can move around, that the manifold is pressed tight up against the engine, seals up, and then we bolt it up here. So because I can't really get a torque wrench in here, because the, all the bottom ones are going to be at an angle, uh, I'm just going to use my air gun and tighten them up. But the torque is 18 foot-pounds. If you can get a torque wrench in there somehow, go for it. But just so you know, the swivel defeats the purpose of the torque wrench because it's going to read wrong. So. Just keep that in mind. back around and double check them all. Now we have to bolt up this flange, stick the bolts down from the bottom so that these top threads, the shorter threads, can uh, start into the manifold and then the bottom gets a nut that clamps everything together. I'm going to go ahead and bottom these out. And that's snug also. Now let's get the two mounting nuts on. Now when you do this, go back and forth between the two so that the um, flange can seat itself evenly, otherwise it'll pull more to one side and then it won't seal up. The uh, torque for these is 30 foot-pounds. Again, there's no way I can torque them because I'm actually at an angle here, so the swivel's going to kill the torque. All right, that's nice and tight. Now let's resecure the dipstick tube for the Transmission, start in the bolt, and we'll bottom it out, snug it up. Use your eight millimeter socket. Doesn't have to be very tight, just make sure it doesn't move around. Perfect. Now let's take the vacuum hoses off of the old EGR tube, and in the same orientation, put them on the new EGR tube. One line will be smaller than the other, so it's gonna be difficult to confuse them because one hose will be narrower than the other. Slide these on. Make sure they're bottomed out all the way. And now let's install this in the vehicle. I'm gonna remove these two bolts that I left here on the throttle body just so I don't lose them. And I'm gonna go ahead and bolt the EGR back up. Now, of course, you should use a gasket here, preferably a new gasket. If you don't have one, you can try and see if you can save and reuse your old one, but most likely it's not going to work. So put on a new gasket, slide this on, and, and bolt it up. Tighten this up. Make sure it's nice and snug so it can seal up. You don't want any leaks here. <coughs> and at the top here, you see this vacuum hose, the green one, that actually plugs in to the EGR valve. Just like that. Now let's go ahead and thread on the lower fitting of this EGR onto the manifold. Let's get it close to being bottomed out. Slide your wrench on it. <clears throat> and make sure that it is nice and tight. Next I want to get this power steering reservoir bolted back up to this bracket so we can continue with putting back brackets on this side. So put back all the bolts that you removed. There should be three 8mm headed bolts. 
we'll snug these up and then move to these here, which actually hold on the bracket for everything that gets bolted up here. And over here went this triangulated bracket, which bolts onto the power steering pump reservoir bracket. And then on the other side, it bolts up to the um, upper radiator hose neck. Now let's put in this bracket, which has the EGR pressure sensor on it, and then this solenoid here. This went right in here behind all these vacuum hoses. This hook, this loop here, went over this first bolt on the EGR valve. So you'll have to slide that over. And then it has a nut that clamps it on. Okay, just like that. Make sure you're not pinching any vacuum lines here. But also don't pull on them too hard because they do break. Plug this in so this connector stops slopping around. I'm going to plug these two hoses in so that this can be situated. So let's put on the nut that holds it on back there. While I'm here, I'm just going to go ahead and plug in these two hoses. One is smaller, one is larger, as you can see. Go ahead and plug them in in their corresponding uh, fitting. Okay, so this nut is on. There's a screw here that secures this bracket to the intake. I'm gonna start by tightening this one. And now let's tighten up this one in the back here. Okay, that's secured. Let's plug this in here. Plug in the uh, sensor. Now let's reconnect this bracket for the uh, throttle cables. Had three screws that mounted it to the intake. Reconnect the throttle cables, attach the spring, attach this cable. And of course, we will attach this one as well. All right, test it. Yep, perfect. No slack. Make sure the throttle body closes all the way. If it doesn't, most likely your cable is not adjusted properly, but if it was before you took the bracket off, it's probably because the bracket isn't sitting far enough in. So just make sure that that is happening. It looks like I do have a little bit of movement. So what I'm gonna do is loosen up the nuts on the bracket just a little bit so I can adjust it. If you don't do this right, you'll have a high idle and uh, well, it's just not gonna be fun. Of course, you could adjust the cable, but you know, it was already adjusted, so might as well adjust it from the bracket. Okay, that's better, actually. So, we'll tighten this up. All right, now I wanna put the alternator back. Had uh, a couple bolts up here. One that just fell in the valley here, but here it is. And then two main bolts on the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to tighten up these bottom bolts first. That will make sure that the alternator's positioned properly, and then I'll tighten up the two top bracket bolts. Make sure they're nice and snug. Now bring the wiring harness over and let's plug it in. The one thing you want to check though is this main power wire. If it has any corrosion on it, go ahead and sand it with some fine sandpaper or a wire brush or whatever you have just to get the corrosion off of there. Uh, mine's actually perfect. so. I'm just going to go ahead and install it. I'm going to route it behind these coolant hoses because I'm pretty sure that's how it was before. I'm going to tighten this one by hand because I don't want to accidentally over tighten it. If you over tighten this, you can break the stud inside the alternator and that would not be good. So just give it a nice quick snug and then plug in the other two wires, which I should have routed behind prior, but here we go. This is one. Make sure that clicks in. And then the other one goes in right here. Make sure this one clicks in as well. Now let's put back the serpentine belt tensioner and the idler. 
get these three started. Let's bottom them out. Let's put on this one as well, and then we'll torque both of them at once. Make sure this pulley is seated all the way. 18 foot-pounds is the torque for all three of these bolts, as well as this 13 millimeter one for the idler. Now I want to clean this area inside here before I put the new water pump on and I'm going to go in with a wire wheel and very, very gently kind of scuff up the surface. I just want to remove some of this corrosion. It's pretty severe, although there, it could be worse, but it's pretty bad and I don't think that this will seal up perfectly in this condition. So that's what I choose to do. If you want, you can do it by hand with some sandpaper or if it's clean enough, you just don't even have to do anything. But you do want to clean it up if it is corroded. Now take the new water pump, make sure the gasket is seated on here, this O-ring, and it's going to seal up nicely. As you can see from the bolt pattern, it can only go on one way with the two closer bolts up here and then the two wider ones uh, for the ones that are further apart at the bottom here. And uh, this freeze plug sits down towards the bottom. If you wanted to, you could put a little bit of coolant on that O-ring to lubricate it or whatever else you prefer. Make sure that when you slide it in, the O-ring doesn't roll over and uh, pop out of its groove. You're gonna have to wiggle it back and forth a little bit. You do want to seat it by hand. You don't want to just suck it in with the mounting bolts. Because sometimes when you pull it in with the mounting bolts, it can actually rip that O-ring and you won't even know it until it uh, doesn't seal anymore. So now let's start these bolts in by hand. Let's snug them up and torque them down. Oops, it popped out. So I guess I'll have to do that again, but at least if these are started, it'll slide in straight. All right, let's bottom these out. Going in a cross pattern just so I can fully seat this water pump. And now we can torque them. The torque for this is 18 foot pounds and I'm gonna do the same thing, go in a cross pattern to make sure that it is fully seated. I'm going to slide in my fan uh, pulley, the water pump pulley, I guess. Line up the bolt holes. Let's bottom these out. The torque is also 18 foot-pounds for these. I'm also going to go in a cross pattern for this one. To torque this, I'm going to use a little pry bar just to try to hold this pulley from spinning. Perfect. Let's put the upper radiator hose in. Make sure it's fully seated on this fitting. Get the clamp and put it right back where it belongs. If your clamp is weak, consider replacing it with either another, with either another one of these or a uh, warm clamp, whatever works for you. It's time to put the serpentine belt back. And to do that, I'm going to show you a diagram on the screen. That way it's going to be a lot easier for you to figure out how it goes other than just looking at the video. But basically I'm going to start around the crankshaft here, around the harmonic balancer. From here, I mean the, the sequence doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of preference. I'm just going to go around clockwise, follow the belt clockwise, making sure that it is on the right pulleys, on the splines and everything. So from here I'm going to go up and around the water pump, then down and underneath the power steering. Then from the power steering, it goes all the way up over the alternator, and then you have to squeeze it through. Oh, here we go. This what happens when you have a new belt. And then from here, you actually have to squeeze it in between the tensioner and the idler so it can reach down to the AC, kind of like this. And you fish it down here, I'm trying to hold tension on it at the same time. All right, so this is it right here. You just have to put a half inch breaker bar in the tensioner, release tension, and then slip it onto the AC compressor, or actually if I take it off the alternator here, I might be able to get this on the AC easier, and then I'll have an easier time putting it on the alternator as opposed to the AC compressor all the way down there, and popped off again. So let's get this breaker bar, push down on this to release tension, 
slide it up on here and remove the uh, breaker. Well, don't remove the breaker bar yet. Uh, what you want to do is, with it still on, make sure that the belt is positioned properly on all of the pulleys. The ribbed ones, make sure that it's sitting in all the ribs. Otherwise, the grooves will cut through the belt as it's riding on sideways crooked. Everything seems perfect, so now you can remove the breaker bar. And uh, when we first start the vehicle, I'm gonna shut it off after a few seconds and uh, double check the belt to make sure that it is properly routed because like I said, if it's not 100% seated, it will uh, jump off and create all sorts of damage. So Now when it comes time to putting on the fan, you have to put it in together with the fan shroud. So drop these two in. Watch out for your radiator fins. You don't want to damage anything. Try to position the fan shroud so that it's as lined up as it can be with the radiator, with its mounting points. At this point, I'm gonna to try to thread on this fan onto the water pump so that it actually holds itself on because it is heavy to uh, hold at this angle. Okay, there we go. Getting it to catch onto the first thread is always the most difficult part, but once it does, you can just spin it and it should easily go on. And now it's bottomed out and we need to tighten it up for which we can use our special fan clutch tool. Set up the tool and tighten it up. The water pump started spinning, so I know it's tight. On the side here, make sure the fan shroud goes down into this hook on the radiator, on both sides that is. Mine did, perfect. Now you can put in the transmission lines. Make sure that it snaps into place like that. Give it a tug to make sure it doesn't pop back out. Bring in the safety lock and lock it over like that. Now let's bolt up the fan shroud. Put in the two little eight millimeter headed bolts that held this on. There's one on each side. Let's get the upper radiator hose in. Bottom it out. Put the clamp back on. Now bring in this cover here at the front, line it up, and let's put in all the push clips that hold this on. And don't forget to put back the spare tire tool. And lastly, the air filter housing with the rest of the intake here. Slide that over the throttle body, just like this. You had two hoses that went in here. Let's tighten up this clamp. Let's make sure this is pushed on all the way when you tighten the clamp. Nice and snug. These hoses are in. There's a wire here. Reconnect the sensor here. And on this side, you had the mass airflow sensor. Reconnect that. Make sure it clicks. Secure the harness and secure the air filter housing. Now to reinstall the battery, make sure it's positioned all the way down on the battery post. It's important so it can make a good connection. And then use your eight millimeter wrench or socket, whatever you prefer, and tighten it back up. Now it's time to fill up the cooling system. What I have set up here is a spill-proof funnel, which also helps bleed the system. Because this is now the highest point in the cooling system, naturally the air will want to rise up into my funnel and not get trapped in the system. The only downside with doing this on this type of system is this overflow tank is also the filler, and it's not supposed to be full. If you fill this all the way up, you are way over full and it's gonna start spilling out once it warms up. So once you do fill this all the way up, if you choose to raise it up into the funnel, you wanna make sure you drain some afterwards, either with a turkey baster or a fluid extraction syringe, whatever you have, or just drain it out the radiator just a little bit. But there's a mark, which I'll show you in a second, and you don't wanna be above that mark, otherwise you're over full. So what I'm gonna do here is just put in a little bit, looks like this wasn't, tight all the way. Make sure this is tight if you use this type of funnel, otherwise it'll leak out here as you, uh, as you do this. So now let's go ahead and put in the appropriate amount of coolant. It'll take about two gallons, maybe two and a half, depending on how much you drained. And if you don't know what kind of coolant to use, refer to your owner's manual and uh, make sure you use the appropriate type. If you look closely, you can see right there, it says cold fill on the reservoir. That's exactly where you want to fill it up to. 
if you put a flashlight in the either in the tank or to the side of it, you'll see the coolant line, the level, and just make sure you don't go past it unless you are actively trying to bleed it in your um, funnel here. So I actually filled mine right up to that fill mark. So now let me run you through the bleeding procedure. First, you want to wait for it to naturally stop bubbling. If it's still bubbling, just give it a minute. Wait for it to stop getting air out of the system. All right, now with the key in the ignition, let's fire it up. Starts right up, that's perfect. Now, once it's turned on, let's uh, turn on some heat here. So turn on the blower, make sure the AC is off. Turn the heat all the way up. I have this digital display. If you have the analog one with the knobs, just turn it all the way up. You want the coolant circulating through that heater core, and I'm gonna set it to vent. That way I can feel when the air blows warm over here. So I'm just gonna give it a minute and then uh, wait for the air to blow over here. While it's warming up, pay attention to this temperature gauge and make sure it doesn't go above the halfway mark. Right now it's still cold. I just turned it on, but once it reaches full operating temperature, shut it off. Uh, and uh, obviously make sure you have heat through the vents. With everything back together, go ahead and run the vehicle and make sure everything is good and then take it for a road test. When only the best will do, demand TRQ. The only company that lets you view before you do. TRQ is committed to offering the highest quality aftermarket auto parts that are engineered for peace of mind. Thanks for using and viewing with TRQ.